Welcome to this time of worship. I'm Pastor Corey Turnpenny, pastor here at the Whitney Point United Methodist Church. Wherever or whenever you're joining us from, we hope you feel connected and encouraged as we worship together in spirit through the gift of technology. You can let us know that you're worshiping with us by liking the video, sharing it to invite your friends. And if it's your first time worshiping with us, let us know that too in the comments. And we just hope you feel connected and encouraged during this time of worship. If you're not on our weekly email list, just type the word email in the comments and we'll get you added because there's lots of great information about everything going on in the church, including our two weekly Bible studies on Tuesdays at 1030 and Wednesdays at 630. And there is the link there to order Easter flowers. You can fill out the online form and send in a check for the Easter flowers in memory or in honor of someone. And they will be available for pickup on Palm Sunday, March 28th at 11 a.m. when we will be coming together in front of the church for an outdoor palm parade. Now, this will be our first in-person gathering since the pandemic started. So, we hope everyone is excited and ready to come and follow the COVID-19 protocols that hopefully you're used to following most everywhere you go. Wearing a mask over your mouth and nose at all times, keeping six feet apart, and of course, just being aware if you're experiencing any um, symptoms, headache, fever, loss of taste or smell, or if you've traveled in the past two weeks, we ask that you would stay home um, from any in-person events. It's going to be very joyful to see each other in person again but it will be very important that we all do everything we can to keep each other safe. We're going to be making these small steps towards seeing each other more, hopefully, and we will need to, to do everything we can to pace ourselves. It's not all going to go back to normal all at once. We'll do the small things we can. It won't be the same right now, but know that we are heading in the right direction. So Sunday, March 28th, in two weeks, we'll have online worship at 10, and then instead of coffee hour chat on Facebook, we'll gather on the front lawn of the church from 11 to maybe 11.30, depending on the weather, for an outdoor palm parade. And we're hoping to also, weather permitting, have an Easter morning outdoor worship service. So you can put that on your calendar and we'll share more information about that next week. At this time, our staff pastor parish relations chair, Mary Hibbard, has a special announcement to share. Good morning. As SPRC chair, I am pleased to share with you this morning that Bishop Webb has appointed Amy Winnie to serve as the pastor of the Whitney Point United Methodist Church beginning July 1st. Although the timeline for the announcement of Pastor Corey's move and Pastor Amy's appointment has been compressed, and I hope you're not feeling whiplash, um, I want to assure you that SPRC had an opportunity to meet with Reverend Nancy Adams, Superintendent of the Binghamton District, to share the skills and attitudes we felt the congregation would be looking for in a new minister. We've also had a chance to meet Amy Winnie. Amy is currently serving in the Melrose and Round Lake United Methodist Churches, which are located in the Albany area. Amy says, within a five month span in 2010, my teaching position was eliminated due to budget cuts. My husband and I separated and I moved in with my parents and then my father passed away. So in the midst of depression and discouragement, I heard God speaking to me, even though I didn't recognize it at first. After a series of dreams in which I found myself behind a pulpit leading a church service, I awoke one morning with a chorus of Here I Am Lord going through my head. Because I had only sung the hymn once before, I emailed my pastor about it. Her response was much like Eli's to Samuel, that it was God calling me into ministry. Going through the early discernment process, I came to realize that yes, God was indeed calling me to a new field of ministry. 
one that involved leading a congregation as their pastor. I am very young in this process, but that call is still leading me forward, and I am open to any and all opportunities that the Spirit guides me to. I'm still in awe of all that God has allowed me to do and has yet to call me to. Amy received her Bachelor of Science degree in music from Robert Wesleyan College in Rochester, her Master of Science degree in music education from the College of St. Rose in Albany, and her Master of Divinity degree from the United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. She has a strong musical background, having been a music teacher, a church pianist, a church organist, and a choir director. It's human nature to face the unknown with a de degree of trepidation. We feel it as we look to Pastor Corey leaving, Pastor Corey feels it as she embarks on a new path, and Pastor Amy feels it as she leaves her church families to come to a different area of the state, to a new community, to join a new church family. Eight years ago, we faced a similar situation as we welcomed and got to know Pastor Corey. We learned and grew together as individuals and, and as a church. That growth will continue as we welcome and get to know Pastor Amy, and we'll continue on our journey of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world through loving and serving God and our community. So I know you'll join me in a few months in welcoming Pastor Amy, and hopefully we'll be able to have some meet and greets before that. They might have to be virtual, but um, it's my hope that we will get to have eyes on Amy before she comes to join us. Um, as always, you should feel free to reach out to myself, to uh, Gretchen Douglas or Mike Burley or my, Mary Michaels as members of SPRC. We'd be glad to um, hear your concerns, answer any questions, um, anything that you have to share with us. That would be fine. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I am hopeful and trusting that everyone will be welcoming and loving to Pastor Amy as she starts to make this transition. And I will do everything I can to bring her up to speed on what we're doing and to help pass the baton for her leadership to take over in July. At this time, I invite you to say hello, good morning, greet each other in the comments and answer this week's welcome chat question, which is, tell us about your favorite pair of shoes. What kind are they? What are they like? Go ahead, put your answer in the comments as we do some singing. Who with me 
my burden shares none but thee dear Lord none but thee just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be Oh, oh, oh. 
Every promise we can make Every prayer and step of faith Every difference we can make Is only by His grace Every mountain we can climb Every ray of hope we shine Every blessing left behind Is only by His grace Grace alone which God supplies Strength unknown He will provide Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. Every soul we long to reach, every heart we hope to teach, everywhere we share his peace is only by his grace every loving word we say every tear we wipe away every sorrow turned to praise is only by his grace grace alone which god supplies strength unknown he will provide christ in us our cornerstone we will go forth in grace alone grace alone which god supplies strength unknown he will provide christ in us our cornerstone we will go forth in grace alone Let's join our hearts together in prayer. O oh God, who is in plain sight, help us notice your presence with us and connect us with Christ, who lived our life, died our death, and rose to life again to prove your love for us. May his life and sacrifice guide us as we seek to live each day in your grace and truth. Amen. Our Bible reading for today is Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. Jesus told this story. A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. So soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in the, that country and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who set him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I am starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and he went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. 
and no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father quickly said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, fetch the fatted calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate for the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Hello, children. We are continuing to find ways to connect with Jesus through different objects that we probably have around our house. And this week, we are using the object of shoes. And I would love to know how many pairs of shoes you have in your house. Not just you, but your whole family. And the ones you've grown out of that are in a box in the closet. How many shoes are there? Uh, all the different kinds that we of things we put on our feet, right? So we've got slippers and soccer cleats and dance shoes and boots for the winter and boots for the rain and sneakers for gym class and nice shoes that you might wear if you come to church and all those shoes that you had all those different kinds of shoes that you've grown out of right that maybe you haven't gotten a chance to donate yet or to give to somebody there are probably lots of shoes in your house. At least I know there are lots of shoes in our house. Little tiny baby shoes that are still hanging around that are being passed down from Wade to Clay and then will probably get passed on to somebody else. But we have all kinds of shoes for all different things. And we like to have those options, right? But if we're connecting with Jesus, we should remember that they, people in Jesus' time, never had shoes like this. They didn't have rubber. They didn't have leather uh, like we do that, that was formed like this. Or they probably didn't even have shoes, regular shoes. Most people where in the place Jesus lived in the Middle East wore sandals because it was hot. So they kept their toes open, but they still needed something to protect the bottom of their feet, especially from hot sand and rocks because they didn't really have paved roads. So, and they walked everywhere they went. So shoes were still very important to them, but they weren't like the shoes we have today. They were probably woven uh, with some twine like rope and maybe some leather, but leather wears out pretty quickly too. So they probably went through several pairs of shoes in their lifetimes, but they probably only ever had one at a time. Uh, and they would wear that one pair of sandals until it got a hole in it and they would either try to mend it or maybe have to get a new pair of shoes made. Um, so it's, a connection point that's important to Jesus. He had shoes, he had sandals, and um, we know that all of his disciples and his friends, all of the men and women that were with him, they wore sandals too. But it was very different than the shoes we have, and it was very important um, to have shoes just as it is now. And and similarly, there are people today that don't have shoes that just, like in Jesus' day, didn't have shoes. And those people were looked on with compassion because they didn't have this thing that is necessary. It keeps us warm and safe and alive, right? So shoes are and have been for a long time a very important thing. They're a human necessity. And yet... With all the shoes that we have today, there are still people that don't have shoes in the world. 
So go through and count how many shoes are in your house and see if there are any that you haven't worn in a while that you might be able to give to someone who needs them. Would you please pray for me now as I pray for you? Living God, make your truth known to us this day and forever, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our table is really starting to fill up as we continue the journey of Lent, using everyday objects to connect with Jesus. Back in July, we set the theme for this year of focusing on our everyday faith and how we connect our beliefs and our commitment to following Jesus to every aspect of our lives. And every series that we've done this year has focused on some aspect of everydayness. And for this season of Lent, as we travel again with Jesus through his final days leading up to his execution on the cross and then his resurrection on Easter, we have been using common objects that are not only common for us, but were also common in Jesus' day as a way of connecting with Jesus and his story of redemption for all life. So we began Lent on Ash Wednesday and connected with Jesus through dust. Then we have used bread, crosses, coins, and now today, shoes. All things Jesus would have experienced in his life. This week we have the object of shoes as a connection point. Jesus likely only had one pair of shoes as a time, at a time through his life, which would have been the norm then. For us today, we might easily forget how lucky we are to have many pairs of shoes, especially as we are tripping over them by the door or searching through our closet for just the right pair for a given occasion. Of course, shoe technology and availability has come a long way in the past 2,000 years. We now have shoes for various seasons, weather conditions, and activities, as well as for fashion statements. Many would say shoes can make or break an outfit, and I think we all know not having the right kind of shoes or properly fitting shoes can make or break your day. Have you ever wound up having to walk much further than you thought you would when you decided on what shoes to wear? Sometimes I've found myself in those situations and I've said, thank the Lord I wore these shoes today. But too often I have been in those situations and thought, oh my gosh, if I had known I'd be walking this much, I would not have worn these shoes. Shoes were much simpler in Jesus' day, but not any less important, especially in a world where everyone walked everywhere they went. Having something to protect your feet on the dusty roads of the Middle East was crucial. So I've been thinking about shoes this week. The story of Holocaust survivor Gerda Weissman Klein who wrote in her book, All But My Life, about her father's instructions on footwear and how they very likely saved her life. That story just kept coming to mind. She talked about how on a hot summer's day, she was taken away and her father demanded that she put on a pair of rugged ski boots. She said, but Papa, ski shoes in June? How could he have known that three years later, those boots would keep her alive on a thousand mile, three month death march in the dead of winter through Germany to Czechoslovakia. She ended up being only one of 120 of the 4,000 women to survive. Shoes can save your life which is why humans have been making and wearing shoes for the past 40,000 years. They're one of our basic needs 
Yet so many people in our world live without proper footwear. One such person was the prodigal son, as we heard in this story from Luke. Though he isn't an actual historical person who lived, Jesus tells this story knowing that many lived the way he did after running off to Vegas with his inheritance and blowing it all in a few weeks. Having no money, but a whole lot of shame, he slinked to the nearest place hiring, which was a pig farm. And as he watched the pigs chowing down on the scraps, he realized this was rock bottom. He determined the next right thing was to just go back home, beg forgiveness, and ask his dad to hire him as a servant, knowing he'd screwed up too big to be his son anymore. But of course, we know what happens when he arrives. His father runs out to see him and calls for the servants to bring him a new robe, the family ring, and a pair of shoes. The robe and shoes were meant to restore his human dignity, and the ring was to restore him to his place in the family. These gifts would have been extravagant in any case, but especially after how he betrayed his family. This was a hugely extravagant welcome home. And this is what Jesus says God's way is like. We are welcomed in again and again. God will restore our dignity and our place in the family as many times as we come back home. It might seem funny to think of shoes as being something that would remind us of God's love, but in some ways I can't think of a better object to serve as a reminder that God walks with us wherever we go, and there's nowhere we can go that's beyond God's love. I will never forget my mission trip to Malawi, Africa when I was in high school. And one day we were at a market and I saw a really cool hand carved game board. It was like in the shape of a fish and it closed up and had all these little uh, beads inside that were like seeds. And it was just amazing, detailed, amazing hand carved game board. But I didn't have any cash with me at the time. So somehow I think our guide was there and translated for me with the two men who were selling it that they would be willing to make a trade for it if I had anything to trade. And I, I happened to have a pair of sneakers in my bag that I didn't necessarily need. So I offered them and they gladly handed over the game. And then each man took off one of their worn down flip flops and they each put on one of the sneakers. And they walked away just beaming, each wearing one sneaker on one foot and one flip flop on the other. And I just looked at our guide and asked, they're sharing the shoes? And they just shrugged and continued on. But I was, I was blown away. I think about what happened to those red and white Adidas sneakers. If they each kept just one, or if eventually the pair ended up going to one person, they got passed around or handed down. I hope whoever wore one or both felt their dignity a little bit more restored and their belongingness to God. Reverend, J. Jill, Reverend Jill J. Duffield in her devotional Lent in Plain Sight reminds us, the familiar story of the prodigal son tells of a young man returning home expecting to be shamed or relegated to secondary status, but who instead receives an unmitigated welcome, new clothing, new shoes, and a party. 
His father sees him, runs out to meet him, and wants only to show him how deeply valued and beloved he is. Grace never does just enough. By definition, grace overflows, explodes, exceeds, gratuitously manifests in unexpected ways. Grace is exhibited by embarrassing public displays of affection, weeping in joy, running in welcome, new robes, new rings, new shoes, a huge party where all are invited so that no one could possibly question their value or belovedness. People get excited about new things, new clothes, the basic necessities. People get excited when their inherent value and dignity, their individuality and their God-given worth is honored and with welcome, celebration, and new shoes too. May we never question our belovedness and may we do all in our power to ensure no one in our life does either. Amen. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Point to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. As we come together for prayer this morning, we give thanks for all your continued tithes and offerings. We are so grateful for your continuing to send those in. And this is our, also our stewardship minute for this week is hopefully you've received a notice of your giving for the past, for 2020, uh, for your records or tax information. And a little note was included with those to let folks know that we had some extra help last year uh, between some grants from the conference and um, some extra funds to cover my maternity leave. Uh, we, had, we had some extra help that we're not going to have this year. So that was a notice of your giving and meant to also be an encouragement to continue that faithful giving, trusting God, setting a goal. The regular um, giving is so important in terms of sustaining the church each month so that we can continue to pay our bills. Uh, so monthly sustained giving 
for my members is so appreciated and is what we need to continue to be in ministry to our community and the world. So thank you and we pray God's blessing on all these gifts that are mailed, given online through PayPal or Facebook. All that information is available to you if you need any help figuring out the best and easiest way for you to continue giving on a regular basis. We're happy to help you with that. As we come together for prayer, we share the joys of Carolyn Reginis' birthday, Riley Head, and Don Sharp, all celebrating birthdays this week. Happy birthday. And we lift up prayers for Jim Hunley, Erwin LaBelle, and Joanne Smith, who are all at various points of recovering from COVID. Um, Erwin is in a nursing home in Syracuse and is not doing very well. We did share his address there if you would like to send him a card. Uh, I know that would be appreciated. And we continue to pray for all those who are sick and recovering. We also lift up prayers for Jean's sister, Mary Lou Windsor, as she continues in battling cancer, but prayers for her continued healing. So let us join our hearts together now as we pray for the needs of our community. Most gracious God, we thank you for your extravagant, extravagant grace and that you welcome us in time after time, restoring us. We pray that you would help us do the same for those in our lives to share and spread your abundant grace. We pray for the many in need of your healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for Jim and Erwin, for Lowell and Mary Lou, for all who are sick, all who are caring for the sick, all of your children in every place. We pray for anyone today who doesn't have shoes, that you would move in the lives of us who have many to share what we have, to protect our fellow siblings and to restore their health and dignity. We pray for our church that you would continue to guide us and lead us into the future you have planned for us. And in all things, we pray that you would help us trust you. Trust that you're with us always, that you forgive us, and that you will continue to provide for all we need. We lift all of these prayers to you as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, for our homework this week, do the same as I told the kids. Go through your shoes and see if there are any you are able to give away. Give to the thrift store or the clothing bank somewhere for folks who need them. And remember, whether we are gathered or scattered, God is with us. In hope or in despair, God is with us. Now and always, God is with us. Go in peace. Amen. In these days of
of Lenten journey, we have seen and we have heard the call to sow justice in the lives of those we serve. We reach out to those who are homeless, to those who live without hope. In the coolness of evening, we'll shelter their dreams. We will call them in mercy and peace. In these days of Lenten journey, we have seen and we have heard the call to sow justice in the lives of those we serve. We open our eyes to the hungry and see the faces of Christ as we know our people who hunger for food. May their faith in our God be renewed. In these days of Lenten journey, we have seen and we have heard the call to sow justice in the lives of those we serve.